My name is Rev. Rachel Harrison, and this is the Recover Your Soul podcast, a spiritual path to a happy and healthy life. I started Recover Your Soul after having profound changes in my life from my recovery of alcoholism, control addiction, and codependency. I was guided to share the tools and principles of spirituality and soul recovery to help others transform their lives as mine was transformed. For us to overcome external circumstances, we must first turn the attention to ourselves, focusing on inner change. Outer positive results in our lives will follow. As a spiritual coach, I can support you on your path to make real changes that will bring you a life of peace, happiness, connection, and abundance. Visit the website recoveryoursoul.net to book coaching sessions, read the blog, listen to some of my original music, and subscribe to receive email updates. I think of Recover Your Soul as a community. Follow us on social media and join the private Facebook group to support each other and connect. For an extra episode each week and to support this podcast, become a Patreon member or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Together, we can do the work that will recover your soul. So today's topic is detachment. And as a member of Al-Anon, detachment is such a important piece of learning how to be okay when it's not okay around you or when the behaviors of people around you are causing you pain. I continue to work on this piece of learning how to be all right when when those that I love around me are not feeling okay. And as I've said in a previous podcast, I heard at some point the saying that you're only as happy as your least happy child. And I took that as a call. It was as if someone said to me, there it is. There's how you feel. This is your reality. And so with great pride, I would say I'm only as happy as my least happy child. Well, I have two now young men, boys. And there were definitely many times when one or both of them weren't happy. And if they weren't happy, I wasn't happy. My other aspect of myself, if you're aware of the Enneagram, which has nine different personality types, I'm a peacemaker. And so I'd also describe myself as saying, if everyone else is okay, I can be okay. And so I spent a lot of time making sure that everybody else was okay so that I could finally be at rest and finally be okay. And the more work that I've done, the more obvious it has become that that isn't healthy, that I, I personally cannot make everyone around me feel okay so that I can finally feel some sense of ease. And to be honest, that's been a really hard journey for me to allow the people around me to be uncomfortable, to not feel like it's my job to jump in and fix it has been a real practice, a daily practice. I'm not very perfect at it. I still struggle at it. And when things are okay, clearly it's a lot easier to be in that space. And then when some situation comes up with my family in particular or friends or the world. There's so much going on in the world right now. I have to really check on myself of how that is creating discomfort in me. And then the aspects of myself that start to jump in and my defense mechanisms or the behavior patterns that I've learned to cope with that discomfort and try to fix or come up with better ideas or solve the problems of those people. And I can't solve the problems of those people. They can solve their problems. If I am asked, I can offer a suggestion, but it's not mine to push in suggestions. So I wanted to read, there's a bookmark that comes from Al-Anon, Uh, which has been such a great journey for me. And it talks about detachment. So I wanted to just talk a little bit 
about what this bookmark says and how it has been profound in my life. Now, in Al-Anon, really, its main piece is that if you have an addict in your life, predominantly from alcohol, since it was Al-Anon was created by the wife of the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they call that your qualifier. And as we know, alcoholism and substance abuse are a family disease. And I heard it said that one alcoholic can profoundly affect, I think it was something like seven to 12 people directly around them, profoundly affect and seriously affect so many more. So when you think about being raised by someone who was an alcoholic or having siblings that were an alcoholic or grandparents or now being married to or having kids who are alcoholics or addicts, that begins to affect the entire family in ways that, if looked at, can be healed, even if the person who is the addict doesn't do any recovery. So in Al-Anon, I've taken that to not just the addicts in my life, of which I am an addict as well. So Al-Anon's great if working with the other people, as well as having some awareness of myself. I can't control what they're doing, but I've tried. So my story is how much I tried to fix and to change the world around me. And people don't have to necessarily be um, alcoholics. We still do this thing where we want to take control and fix and change what's around us. So the more that my life with my husband and my kids became stressful, the more I jumped in and wanted to fix it and tried to manipulate the situation so that there wasn't as much fighting and there wasn't as much anger. And the more that I did that, the more unreasonable I became to live with because my expectations of what I wanted were not happening. And so I was constantly disappointed in how things were going. And really, really, my heart just ached. My heart just ached. My husband and my oldest son had a really... Um, complicated relationship where they loved each other so much, but there was just this piece where they struggled. And that was incredibly painful for me. And so I started to try to keep everything from falling apart. And in keeping it from falling apart, I didn't know that I was actually stopping what could have been healthier for them in their own relationships. So in detachment, one of the first things that's listed is not to suffer because of the actions or reactions of other people. That's a tough one. Somebody else's actions or reactions were everything about how I felt like I could be. And to really let go and detach and be able to observe somebody else's behaviors or feelings And recognize that that is outside of myself and that I can't or shouldn't try to change it and to step back and really be in my own space of my own heart and have compassion and love, but not feel like I have to take on those emotions with them has been a journey, but it's working. And I can now be able to look at somebody who's really hurting. And my heart just feels, it feels more than it could ever feel before because I can feel an empathy for them, but I don't feel like I have to take it on myself. I didn't have the bandwidth to take it all on myself. The next one is not to allow ourselves to be used or abused by another in the interest of another's recovery. So my oldest son went to rehab when he was 16 years old. And I remember when the person, uh, the leader of the, the rehab facility said, it's not if they relapse, it's when they relapse. And I remember being appalled because 
we were paying all this money and had raised all this money for him to be able to go to this rehab center. And I thought that I was taking him to some place that would fix him forever. That this was, this was it. This was going to be the answer. He was going to not have to suffer from addiction. And this was going to be the end all. And when I had that realization that this was outside of my hands, that this is an offering that we could give him, which I think that he will say he was grateful to go to and had had uh, changes in his life that he's taken with him. I had to let go of the fact that I didn't know what was going to happen out of it. And the interest of his own recovery, I was putting myself in a situation where that was my number one focus in my life, that his recovery was the main focus. And the truth is, it's his recovery. Even at that young age, he had to be the one to take that on and be willing to invest in it. And my investment in it wasn't going to change how he did his. I can't make him or anyone else in my life want it. He has to want it. And because I'm recovered myself, the only way that I've had this recovery is because I want it. I wanted to be happier. I wanted to be free of the obsession and the darkness that came from my drinking. I wanted it. The next one is not to do for others what they can do for themselves. How many times have I tried to make it easier for somebody and do for them what they could do for themselves? And you think you're being helpful. Oh, I'll do that for you. Why don't I run down to the store and get you everything that you need? And, and it's as if what we're telling them is you can't do it for yourself. So I'll do it for you. Do not do for others what they can do for themselves. It's easy to be an act of love to overdo. We don't even realize that we're becoming an enabler to someone else's addiction by trying to be helpful to them. I know for me that I felt like if I did these things, if I jumped through hoops, it would make their lives a little bit easier and then they wouldn't be as stressed out. And if they weren't as stressed out, they would be less likely to make certain choices. But that's not fair to them. And it's really not fair to me. Because I'm so involved in making sure that their life is a certain way, I'm forgetting whose life I'm responsible for, and that's my life. The next one is not to manipulate situations so that others will eat, go to bed, get up, pay bills, not drink, or behave as we see fit. Another interesting one that really comes down to you think you're being loving. You think you're being helpful. I thought I was being loving. I thought I was being helpful by, did you set your alarm? Are you all set for the day? Did you pay that bill? Oftentimes, if they didn't pay that bill, then I would give them the money so that they could pay that bill. The manipulation comes out of kindness. It comes out of a depth of heart of trying to be helpful and loving and kind to somebody. And in that, It is not helping the situation. It's actually making the situation worse until we're so caught up in somebody else's well-being that we've completely lost ourselves. Watching somebody not pay their bills and not get up and not do the things that they're supposed to do is absolutely painful and grueling. But those consequences are their consequences when they don't do what needs to happen. I know that for me, I had a different definition of what a bottom was in somebody else's behavior than clearly what their definition of their own bottom was. And what I realized was I needed to hit my own space of if this is enough for me and I'm at a place where this feels like unmanageability and it's affecting my life in a negative way, then I have to do my work on myself and step away from the situation with somebody else where I'm trying to to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. 
that's actually not my decision to make that they can't do for themselves. The more I do for somebody else, the less they learn to do for themselves. The next one is not to cover up for another's mistakes or misdeeds. Again, how much we try to help somebody else and keep them from consequences, keep them from trouble. I think honesty and really being honest with myself on the depth of level that I have worked on myself since I started my recovery two and a half years ago, that honesty has created a space where I can really see how I always think of myself as a really honest person. So how it's a side piece where I'm not lying to somebody, but I might omit a full truth to keep it from getting as bad as it, I feel like it might be if the whole truth was out. And I think I definitely can see that I did that with people in my life that I was trying to save them from this piece of ourselves, right? This, the hard, the hardship that will come. So to not cover up for another's mistakes or misdeeds is to really let them have their own consequences of their own actions. And if I'm involved by covering up or or not allowing the full truth to come out, then it is also my own secret. And in my life, I want to let go of all the secrets. The next one is not to create a crisis. And the next one is not to prevent a crisis if it's in the natural course of events. Wow, that one. Not to prevent a crisis. Watching somebody that you love be in crisis is heartbreaking. But if I think about myself and if I think about the learning that I've done, it all came because I had to have my own depth of sadness. I had to have my own consequences. And I'm grateful for those moments in my life where I recognized that I didn't want to live this way anymore. This wasn't working for me. These emotions weren't working for me. These relationships weren't working for me. Whatever the situation was, I had to have those epiphanies and those experiences in myself. So if I'm preventing a crisis in somebody else's life, I don't know how I'm getting in the way of spirit and what their journey is. And that's been probably my greatest awareness. That the detachment doesn't mean that I don't love somebody. It doesn't mean that my heart is not full. It means that I can allow them to have their own experience and their own life without having to be 100% involved in every aspect of it and have it consume me. I've heard some people in the rooms kind of jokingly say that they've detached with a chainsaw, that they've had to really cut relationships out of their lives that were unhealthy. And that couldn't be true. There are a few relationships in my life that I have had to make a very decisive and painful decision to say that this isn't healthy for me and that I can love them, but I don't want any interaction with them in my life. And the forgiveness work of allowing them to be themselves and see the pain that they have in their heart that may have caused the pain that I felt by having them in my life, but I can't have them in my life. But I've been able to detach with love my direct family members and friends who I want in my life. I want to experience every aspect of their lives with them, but I can't be emotionally invested in feeling like I have to participate in each of their decisions, each of their choices. I've had to detach and let them have their own decision-making. And through that, a great freedom has come to me where I can truly, truly, truly be present for them and hold the space and keep my tongue tied and try to give them a love and support so that they can work through their own solutions with their higher power, with their journey. 
I've got enough to work on in my own brain, in my own heart, in my own life. And not taking on all of their things have really given me space to be more contented and to be happier and wholer in my own self and my own well-being. We learn that we can't create or fix outside of ourselves. And the more awareness we have to that, the more whole that we can be in ourselves and the more of a light that we can be to the people around us so that they may want to work on themselves and find their connection to their higher power and an inner peace. Are you wondering, how do I go deeper on my path to soul recovery? Or how do I support this great podcast? Well, here's how. Here's your call to action. If you're ready for real inner change and would like to work directly with me, visit the website and book a coaching session. I'm here to support you on your unique path. I'm here to help you let go of the past, to deepen your connection with your higher power, whatever that is for you, and to discover and then step forward into a happy and healthy life. You can also become part of our soul recovery community. One way is to join the support group. It's the first Monday of every month. It's by Zoom from 6 to 7 p.m. Mountain Time, and you can register on the website to get your Zoom link. Recover your souls on social media. Of course, there's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, lots of ways to connect. And there's even a private Facebook group that will allow for more communication and conversation about soul recovery. There is also an extra bonus episode every Friday if you are an Apple Podcast subscriber or Patreon member. I'd also love all of the listeners to subscribe on the website so that I can keep you informed on what's going on with the podcast, the community, with me, and anything that's up and coming and new and great about soul recovery. Also, if you just take a little bit of time to give me five stars, a quick review, and to share the podcast with your friends and family, we're helping even more people to have soul recovery in their lives. If this podcast is providing you spiritual nourishment and inspiration, thank you, thank you for going to the website and pushing the donate button, whatever donation feels right to you. This means so much to me because I have this enormous mission of sharing soul recovery with the world and your donations, your bookings, your subscriptions, your being part of this community is helping that to happen. Together, we can do the work that will recover your soul.